Let's pray. Father, I, uh, man, Lord, we, we just thank you for who you are. We acknowledge now that you are God. You are almighty, all-powerful, wonderful healer. The one who spoke creation into existence. The one who breathes life into us. And so it's there, God, that we humbly ask that you would speak to us as we open up your word today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak in the only way that you can speak. May you move in the only way that you can move. From the youngest to the oldest, that we would know that you are here today. Lord, I pray that you would tune our hearts and our ears to your words. Block them from mine and block them from my agenda. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. In your son Jesus' name we love you. Amen. He would jump three times in the air, bringing his knees to his chest. And he would reach out and stretch out his legs and stretch out his arms. He would move his neck from side to side, kind of getting loosened up. He would take a couple steps forward. He would get down on all fours, and then he would shake out his right leg. And then he would place it into the foot pedal of the right block. And then he would do the same thing with the left leg. He lift a mirror, the right leg. And then he will walk his hands back and get behind the line. And then he will lean back on his knees. And he will look down that track at what the finish line looks like and With a deep breath and a quick prayer, he will put his hands behind that line, his feet into the blocks, his butt will raise up into the air, and he will load up his legs ready to shoot out like a cannon, and then pow, and at the sound of that gun, he will go sprinting down that track, and his body will move like a poetic sonnet as his head stays still, his arms violently raised from chin to butt, front to back, and his legs start to turn like pistons as he flies down the track in a blur. As his eyes come up at about 60 meters, as he gets to look down at what he thought was the finish line, he will cross through and then realize that it's not really the finish line. That something happened, that this isn't the race he signed up for. He got into the blocks at the wrong race and he has continued to run past and he will start to realize that the sprint he thought he was on, he is now on a marathon. And he will start to realize that I have to make some adjustments because I came out of the blocks a little too fast and I'm going to not make it to the finish line. I'm going to die out and I'm not going to make it. And so he starts to make a little bit of an adjustment. He starts to go on autopilot and some cruise controls. He starts to jog the rest of the race. About a mile into the race, he starts to notice this isn't even just a normal marathon. This is like an Ironman race, an obstacle, a steeplechase, because there's now obstacles put in his path and that start to get in his way. And he starts to have thoughts in his mind of, should I just stop doing this race? Should I still stop running this? Because it's not what I signed up for. It's not what I wanted to do. This wasn't the part that I wanted to be in. And, and he starts to start to contemplate after one and two and then the fifth obstacle and the 10th tenth obstacle, he starts to wonder, do I still want to be part of this race? I think many of us are running that kind of a race. I think many of us have those same exact feelings. I came out of the blocks with my Christianity real excited. I remember that moment that I gave my life to Christ at a mountaintop experience or a camp or some uh, Sunday service where I sat in the chair and thought, man, that message was just for me. And I gave my life to Christ at that moment. And uh, I was so excited. And about 100 yards in, 100 meters into my race, it started to get a little tiring. I started to get a little exhausted. I realized my sprint wasn't actually a sprint. It turned into a marathon, and I wasn't signed up for a marathon. I was excited for a few months, maybe a few years, but now I'm on autopilot and cruise control, and then life got hard, and this Christian walk got hard, and now I didn't sign up for the obstacles and trials that came onto my path, and I don't know if I signed up for this race. My guess is some of us uh, have either turned on autopilot Or we're so proud of the race that we run that we have a little bit of a pride that comes with our race because we like to show people our rearview mirror and show them what happens in our race and where we're still at with God and how we faithfully follow and the pride that comes with how well I've run my race. See, I think there's those two races are kind of common for Christianity, at least American Christians. I think that's the kind of paths that are easy to follow because we get on this mode where we start to go autopilot and cruise control because of, man, maybe I served God for a long time and I served my church for a long time and now I'm just, it's my turn to coast. It's my turn to cruise through life. And so now I don't need to serve in ministries or I don't need to volunteer anywhere. Or, you know, what? Sunday is just a checklist item for me. I was good and faithful for a long time. Now Sunday is just my checklist. Or maybe you're at the part of your race where 
Man, life has been terrible. And I've seen people who have crumbled under the terrible parts of, my, of life and the things that I've dealt with. And it's been hard. And you're looking back and going, man, I'm still faithful to God. And I'm still serving God. And even though life was hard and then obstacles were put in my way and trials were put in my life, I'm still running and I'm still faithful. And check out my race. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. And there starts to become this pride, maybe even legalism that starts to fall in there. I become this kind of smug Christian. You see, the, the, these things, I think, the Bible addresses a really, really, really well-known common verse. Uh, there's a couple of passages we're going to look at today. I think the Bible and Paul, in one of his letters, really addresses these things, two of which are, are the dangerous paths that we follow down, and one is really what the antidote is to those paths. And so we're going to spend some time today in looking at that, and I'm hoping that I encourage you in this to maybe change your race run it the way you used to run it, or maybe you've just never ran it before, or, or, or hopefully challenge you to change the way you've been running your race, to push on further, to strive more, to want to do more. That prayer moment, what has gone on at Demonte Ranch High School, what has not just there, but affected our young people, what has affected our community, I think should put a, a, a sense of urgency. I know for me, that's what it was. A sense of urgency. I was on vacation with my family when I got the news about that. And I uh, talked to another youth pastor in town just to kind of get some information and find out what was going on. And there was this moment at the end of that conversation that I was like, man, we still have some time on our vacation, but there's a sense of urgency. I'm ready to get back. Because there's something that we need to do. We have a, like Richard said, man, we have a role in this to change the eternity for people. So my hope is, is that you jump on that same race and that, that, that we together as a body of Christ, as a church, do that for our community, for our city, our country, and our world, just like those people who are in Cambodia right now. If you have your Bibles, open up to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Woo! Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right-hand throne of God. Before, before we uh, go on, uh, let me address this first. Uh, to be in the race, you have to... Like, 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 like to run the race, you have to be in the race, right? So you don't run the race of Christianity if you have not made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior over your life. If you have not uh, confessed that, if you have not done that with him, you are not even in the race. And so if you are sitting here today and you have never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, if Holy Spirit does not live inside of you, if you are not a Christ follower, a Christian, then you aren't even in the race. Okay, so we have to address that first because you have to be in the race before you can actually run the race. The Greek word for race is uh, agon, which is where we get that, that the word for us, agony, right? A race is not a thing of passive luxury, but is demanding, sometimes grueling, and agonizing. It requires our utmost self-discipline, determination, and perseverance. You don't win the gold medal in the, in the Olympics without going for years of training, years of discipline, years of hard work. The Greek word for endurance is hupumone. Uh, it means continuing even when everything in you wants to slow down or give up. This, sl this steady determination, the endurance that the writer of Hebrews is telling us to do is, is, is the Christianity when stuff, stuff is hard and everything in me wants to give up on life. Everything in me wants to just not do this. Everything in me says, man, there's got to be an easier way to live my life. It says, no, I run with endurance. Have the endurance, the steadfastness to kind of continue on this race. See, I think if you're a Christian, then running the race with an endurance uh, really means just don't give up on the life. I think we do this thing, um, oh, you know that, that what's that saying? Um, uh, God gives his toughest battles to his strongest warriors or whatever it is, or he wouldn't give you something you can't handle. God doesn't throw temptation in your way. That's not who, get, that, that comes from Satan. He is holy. He doesn't put sin into your life, temptation into your life, obstacle. He is holy God, meaning he cannot be joined with sin. That's why Jesus Christ had to die on the cross for us. His price had to pay, his death and resurrection had to pay the price for us to get there. We sinful man could not be joined with holy God, meaning holy God does not put sin in your life. We were born into sin, but that's not who God is. And so that, those statements and saying stuff like that, well, you're his strongest warrior, that's why your son passed away. No, 
That's not true. That's not encouraging. You're his strongest warrior. It doesn't make you feel better. We've got to stop doing stuff like that that has no biblical background, doesn't help people, and that's a statement we put on Facebook or we tell people that has no truth to it. I think the real truth is, is um, I don't know why. I, all I know is that we're in a fallen and broken world, and the only Savior of that is Jesus Christ. I don't know. I'm sorry that that's what life is. I also know that the Bible never promised that this is an easy thing. I know that, 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 that we know that the devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy, and that's what he does. See, the point of running a race is to win the race. I believe that many Christians are running the race and they don't really want to win. I think many Christians are just kind of at the race, are just in attendance. I don't think it makes any sense to run a race that you don't want to win. That isn't, that isn't like um, the RTO, right? I don't like running. So if you run the RTO, good for you. But the RTO, I have no desire to win that race meaning I have no desire then to run that race. It, makes no, it doesn't make sense in my mind. If I'm in a race, like I want to win, right? And that should be our race that we are running as Christians, not to win for my own personal glory, for his kingdom. I run the race to bring more people into the race so more people would know Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. See, I think the lack of desire to win is a basic problem with many Christians. I think they're content simply to be saved and wait to go to heaven. Cool, I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. Now I'm cool chilling. But in a race or in a war or in the Christian life, lack of desire to win is unacceptable. I think the author here warns us of how we become a, Christ, a, a comfortable Christian. And the path to comfortable Christianity is marked with idols. And he says, lay aside every weight. And uh, I think when talking about weight we carry, it's not necessarily always bad in itself. Right, but it, it can tend to... Um, slow us down in our race. It can tend to get in the way of our race. Uh, there was this uh, Olympic gold medal, medalist that uh, won the gold medal, was considered fastest man in the world. And uh, a couple years later, he came to the U.S. to run at an invitational only meet. So he shows up. People are so excited. Fastest man in the world is here. We're going to watch him run. And uh, if you know anything about track, like you have preliminary heats first, right, before you kind of get to that. Like he didn't even qualify in the prelims. And they asked him afterwards, you know, I, I don't know why they do this in track. If, I like watching the Olympics. When they, when they run in track, they like interview them immediately after. And so you get this like heavy breathing and it's like the weirdest thing. It's like, <sighs> like what, what, why? Give them a break. Let them get a drink of water and then do the interview. It's, I don't understand it. Um, but it has nothing to do with the story. Um, <laughs> but the man is, uh, they, they interview him and they ask him, man, what happened? He said, I'm overweight said, I ate too much and trained too little. I just have too much weight. It was a simple answer. But I think if you look at uh, some of times our race, I'm running the race. I'm just not running the best I can simply because I have some extra weight that I'm carrying around. And the author says, man, just lay aside all of that. See, I think uh, th this is us in our, in our Christian walk. I think this is us in our race. And I think this starts to become an idol for us when I start to not want to cut off the excess weight. The things that are slowing me down in my, uh, in my race for Christ, to know him more and wanting to be more intimate or know God more and wanting to do his will. Um, I think sometimes I can look like something as simple as like a Netflix or wanting to binge watch something, um, right? And wanting to tune my mind off because I if I want to turn it off, I want to disengage from the world. And so I put that on um, or watch something or, or just so I don't have to engage in really what's happening around me. Um, I think something as simple as that sometimes can be one of those things. Sometimes we don't even realize that it's that. And then I've watched seven seasons of The Office in like two days, and I had no idea. Um, right? It's, it's, it's one of, I think it's one of those things that sometimes we don't always uh, see it. And it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. I just think sometimes that extra weight can just be something, um, something small in my life that's really not detrimental to my spirit. It's just keeping me from running the best race I possibly can. Right, and I think that's where it starts to become kind of idols for us. Is, is, and we don't even realize that that's what that has become in my life. Uh, I think, honestly, uh, some of those weight things can be ourselves. I think it's sad uh, many Christians are not only not running the race themselves, that many have become the obstacle in other people's race. I think there's many Christians who are sitting on the track and they're the hurdle that people have to get by. You're now the weight that someone else has to cut off because you're not running your race. 
And now you're dragging, you're, you're the extra weight that they are now running their race slower and not as best as they can. So I think the author also says, uh, lay aside, or the also, author also says to lay aside every sin. Sin, simply put, that which keeps me from perfect relationship with God, anything that is not obedient to the perfect will of God. Literally anything that's not being perfectly obedient to God is sin. Anything that's keeping, that severs that relationship is sin. Right? I think sins can easily be, some sins can easily be avoided, but they're not. I think some sins are admired, yet must be laid aside. Something so like, like a common is like financial wealth. When, when I'm more greedy than generous, um, I'm not saying financial wealth is a sin, but when that becomes my priority and that becomes my idol, um, that then it starts to become my sin. Uh, uh, some sins are ensnaring, and that's especially harmful. Some sins are more dangerous than others, like sex outside of the biblical confines of marriage between a man and a woman, uh, and, and, and anything outside of that is now becoming a sin. Uh, I think all sin is harmful to our relationship with God and our testimony to Jesus Christ. All become idols when we do not repent, when we do not turn away from those sins and instead continue to live in the life of sin means we put that sin in a higher priority than Jesus. See, when I continue to make sin my idol, then I have become a very comfortable Christian. It's a sad, it's a scary day when I am comfortable with my sin when I am comfortable in the way that I live my life and knowing that it's sinful and it causes separation from God. What a scary day that is when I am sitting there and I am com- more comfortable in my sin than comfortable in the presence of Jesus Christ. That is a scary day for a Christian because you have fully become comfortable as a Christian. I am comfortable with exactly where I am and I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to change anything else. I don't want to be pushed farther. I don't want God to work in my life anymore. I don't want to become more like Jesus. I don't want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I just, I'm good right here. When I become comfortable like that, you're in a dangerous spot. See, for some of us, we've become comfortable Christians. We're more fans of Christ than followers. We cheer on those that are running the race. We're the hand clappers. Good job. You guys are doing it. We like their Facebook when they are doing it but we're not doing it. We're just fans of those that are in the race. We stand on the sidelines and cheer the rest of the people on. We clap for those in Cambodia, but we're not willing to go serve on a mission trip or serve in our church or whatever it looks like. See, Jesus Christ did not come to save the world from sin and death so that you could applaud his race. He did not come so that you could pat him on the back and cheer for him. He came and then said, okay, now you go and do it. You go and be my hands and feet. I'm going to leave so the Holy Spirit can live in you to empower you to go and do this. I think for some of us, man, we just got comfortable in our race. We've, we've turned on autopilot in our Christianity, and we're just cruising through this. And I think for others, we've fallen down a different dangerous path. It's out of that smug Christian, the one who has this pride about, man, look at how I've run my race. The path to a smug Christianity is marked with pride and legalism. Flip over to Matthew 15. I need to get a bigger print. I'm getting old. I'm not even kidding. I'm serious. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 3. It says, he answered them. Oh, actually, I'm going to read from the message version. I like theirs. Um, There are some Pharisees that asked Jesus, like, hey, how come your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? You know, and this is Jesus. I like the message version. Um, I think it's funny the way he says it. It says, but Jesus put it right back on them. Why do you use your rules to play fast and loose with God's commands? God clearly says, respect your father and mother, and anyone denouncing father and mother should be killed. But you weasel around that by saying, whoever wants to can say to father and mother, what I owe to you, I've given to God. This was so the, the, the Pharisees can get like the people's money and stuff and, and not like it was, it was their way around. They were, changed, they, they were using scripture uh, to benefit themselves and their life. Um, it says, that can hardly be called respecting the parent. You cancel God's commands by your rules. Frauds. Isaiah's prophecy of you hit the bullseye. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy. They twist scripture to fit their life. See, the smug Christian can deceive other people, but not Jesus. The Pharisees fooled everybody. They would stand in the courtyards during the busiest time of the day, and they would pray really, really loud. So people walking by would go, man, they are holy. They are good Christians. Good job. They are on it. 
And Jesus says, man, you guys are fooling everybody, but you don't fool me. You do it, you're loud, you're boastful about it, but your heart isn't in it. See, I think our pride and legalism can do that same kind of thing. It keeps us from God. We can, appear to draw, we can appear to draw near to God, just as the Pharisees did, all the while having our heart far from Him. See, I think we can impress others with the image of Christ followers, but our heart isn't in it. I think Satan has no greater ally than the hypocritical Christian. Hypocrites have no greater ally than tradition. Think about it. Tradition can be followed mechanically and thoughtlessly without conviction, sincerity, or purity of heart. Because traditions are made by men, they can be accomplished by men. They require no faith, no trust, no dependence on God. And not only that, they appeal to the flesh of feeding pride and self-righteousness. Because traditions require no integrity of heart, they are easily substituted for true worship and obedience. Hear me, I'm not saying that all traditions are bad. There are some traditions that are phenomenal, like uh, a communion, right? It, it puts this reverence moment, and it's a traditional thing that we do. Uh, but many traditions help us to remember, cherish, and honor things that are noble and beautiful. But when traditions are substituted for, or in any way distort or distract from God's word, they are an offense against God and a barrier to right worship and living. See, I think when that stuff becomes, starts to happen, that, that when I'm more worried about the, the traditions of my Christianity than the walk of my Christianity or the God of my Christianity or the Jesus who of my Christianity, when I'm more worried about the, the traditions that I do and my heart isn't in it, it starts to become an idol. It starts to become this checklist. Yep, I did that one. See, Jesus was condemned and crucified because he exposed the vileness of religious hypocrites for calling out the prideful and legalists of the day and bringing light to their false teaching and false Christianity. Jesus Christ did not die so that we could make a big show of him, but not have our heart in it. He did not die so that we could act like we worship him, but don't mean it. He did not die so that we can use the Bible to twist its word to fit our lifestyle, no matter what that is, whether it's our politics, our sexuality, our feelings, whatever it is. God, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross so that I can then take his word and go, well, this is how it fits in my life. This is where it fits, and this is where I agree. That is not what he did. You take all of him or nothing. It's why when, you, when they did the Passover, you had to eat the whole lamb. You didn't just get to leave part of it because there's a representation that you don't get to take parts of Jesus. You take all of Jesus. From Genesis through Revelation, you take it all. You don't get to pick which parts of Scripture you want to believe in and what you want to agree with and then twist it around to fit your thoughts and your feelings and start to feed your pride. I think Paul is the one who gives us a great antidote to this. See, Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, uh, Philippians 3, he starts to write this, this, this antidote of what this really looks like, of how we don't fall into these two paths. And I think that antidote is to never stop chasing after Jesus. As, as simple as that sounds, uh, as I think every Christian probably thinks, that, that, that's what you're supposed to do. I think Paul writes this very, very specifically. It says, this is what it looks like to never stop chasing after Jesus. Philippians 3 verse 7 says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus or Paul is simply writing, man, compared to Jesus, nothing else is equal. Everything is lost. I'm willing to lose it all for Jesus of knowing him, of a personal relationship with him, an intimacy with the living God. Paul put a personal relationship with Jesus Christ at the center of Christian's life. He joyfully accepted the loss of all other things because it was greater joy, it was greater gain to know God. See, I think the foundation for the Christian life is in what Jesus has done for us, not what we have done for him, not what we are continuing to do for him, or not what we will do for Jesus in the future. It is what he has done for us. Paul disowns his own righteousness 
If you read on, um, Paul will talk about all these things that kind of, sh- according to Pharisees, like would have made him righteous. And he disowns it all. The same way like other people would disown their sins. He disowns it all. He clings to the righteousness of Christ, which becomes ours by faith and trust in him. See, knowing Jesus is not the same as knowing his historical life. Knowing Jesus is not the same of having, as having correct doctrines about Jesus. Knowing Jesus isn't the same as knowing his moral example or his great work on our behalf. It is some of that, but it's so much more. Saying, man, I, I know the life of Jesus doesn't make me have this relationship with Jesus. I can, uh, I can read a book on Abraham Lincoln or his historical life. I don't know the man. Right, there's, the, there's this other part that comes with it. And that's what Paul is writing. There's this other part with this race that just says, man, just go after him with everything. Paul's plea here is that we would know Jesus intimately and personally, both his power and his sufferings. Notice he says both of those things. I want to know the power of the Almighty God, but I also want to know the sufferings of Jesus. Because Jesus said, the world will hate you because they hated me first. They will persecute you and, and be mean to you and torture you and do all this stuff to you because they did it to me. So, so don't be surprised when it happens to you. And then he encourages us to the prize of the upward call of, of God in Christ Jesus. The prize is the, whoa, the prize is the call itself, not the benefits that come from it. The prize is being able to run the race at all. The prize is the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again and defeated the grave. The prize is the fact that I get to put my feet on the track and run the race at all. The prize is that I get to pursue God at all. The prize is that I can come before the Almighty God at His throne and and pray for somebody else who lost their family member. That I get to step in the gap for those who are in pain and mourning. The prize is that I can come to God with all my fears and all my worries and all my problems and everything that I have. The prize is that I can come to God and worship Him. See, I think, uh, I think the prize being able to run that race is also realizing a working partner with God, that he partners with me in his kingdom. See, when I begin to realize that it is an honor and privilege to run the race, then I begin to look for opportunities to do more in my race. I am not okay just running my race. I start to look for opportunities to use my race, to serve my race. I I start to look for opportunities to bring people in the race with me. I start to realize that the track I'm running on, there's no one else running on the track with me. There's open lanes, meaning I want to bring other people in relationship with Jesus Christ so they can now be on the race with me, that they can fill in those lanes. I... uh, when I was still at the South Campus, when I was still uh, overseeing our student ministry, we were sitting in a staff meeting, and they brought up the fact that uh, they were going to open up another classroom for our 815 service, and they didn't have teachers. It was one of our preschool classes, like four and five-year-olds. And uh, I remember talking to my wife about it, and she was like, why don't you do it? I was like, Good point. I could do it. It was an opportunity for me in my race to start serving more. It was an opportunity for me to serve, and I started recognizing, yeah, I can do that. It was one of my favorite things on Sunday mornings, 8.15, every Sunday morning. That was me with these like six, seven kids. Four of them were crazy. Um, it was so much fun because, you know, crazy kids, it's like I have them for an hour and I send them back home, um, <laughs> right? But it was, it was so much fun. And what the coolest part was, was I got to teach them about stories in the Bible. And, and uh, I don't ever get to hear like what was happening when those kids were going home and if it was life changing for them, and that's okay. Um, I know for me as a parent, man, my two-year-old, uh, because of the people who serve in our preschool ministry, because of the preschool at Life Church Monday through Friday, um, because of those people that are serving, that are giving and pouring into the, my kid's life, uh, my daughter will walk around and we'll be in a grocery store and she'll just yell out, Jesus can do everything. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then she'll ask for like marshmallows. I'm like, ah, oh, Jesus isn't doing that one. <laughs> but uh, it's like crazy. Or, or she'll sing these songs that she learned in church that I know I don't sing those songs. And I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing? And she just will walk around the house singing them. And I love that. And what I realize is, uh, you know, sometimes we do a video message over from South Campus. I started to realize that during that time, I could actually go serve. And so something like my wife and I are going to do is when there's like maybe a video of Pastor Dave or Tom or preaching here live, we're going to take that time to go serve in our preschool ministry. Why? Because it's an opportunity to bring some more people into our race. Some more people to get on the board. 
Statistics say like 80% of Christians gave their life to Christ before 18. That means I have an opportunity to go and help those young people know Jesus Christ at a very early age. I think that's an awesome opportunity. That's part of the race that I want to look for opportunities. When I start to realize, man, it's a privilege to run the race with God. It's a privilege to be used by him. Then I want to look for ways to use that, to do that, to share that with people, to share Jesus with people. See, I think ultimately Paul is telling us never to stop chasing after Jesus, never stop pursuing him, never stop learning about him, never stop getting to know him deeper, more intimately, more personally, never stop becoming more like Jesus. And I think it's, it's, it's easy to say those things, but I think sometimes we don't even realize that we either become, have this pride now in my, in, in my walk with God, or it's come to this part that I'm comfortable right where I'm at, and I don't want to be stretched any further, and I don't want to serve more, and I don't want to have a bigger impact, because I know the more I start to serve, the more attacks that maybe start coming my way, and I, I don't want any of that. I'm good right here. Or life just seems absolutely crazy. Everything seems absolutely up in the air, and I don't want to do more. See, I think God is calling us simply to a life of obedience. That's ultimately what he says. Obey me. He is calling us to set aside our sins and follow his call. Our hearts are to be laid bare before God, not as a thing to do, but as an intimate relationship where he wants an active say in our life. For some of you here, man, you're not even in the race at all. You have never been on board with this. Maybe this is your first time. I don't know. For some of you, you've never, you're not even in the race. You're just sitting in the stands. You're not even cheering those on who are in the race. You're just there in attendance. See, here's what, um, here's what the book of Romans says. In Romans 3.10, says there's no one righteous, meaning you can't earn heaven. Nobody can. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin is death. That death was paid, that cost was paid by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He bore that, but you have to accept and acknowledge that he is Christ. He is Jesus Christ. He is Lord and Savior of your life. If not, you will have to pay the wages of that, that sin, which is eternal separation from God. In Romans 10, 9, man, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for some of you, maybe you're not even in the race. And if you want to be in the race and you want to do that with God, there's people from our prayer team after service who would love to pray with you. I don't need to do that prayer. If you want me to pray with you, I'm happy to do that with you. It doesn't have to be me. You don't even have to do it with someone from the prayer team. You can do it with yourself, with God. You can do it with people around you, maybe family or friends that you're here with today. But I just want to let you know, if you're not even in the race, then none of this really pertains to you because I can't encourage you to keep running because you're not even in it. I do know that the Jesus Christ that came, that died on the cross, that rose again, had you personally on his mind. You by name. He knew you. Like that is, that is the God that I know. For the rest of us, man, those that consider yourself to be Christians, maybe, man, you start off like the sprinter. You came out of the blocks hot, man, and you were on fire for God. About 100 meters in, something happened. Life hit you, it got hard, obstacles got put in your way, you realize this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon, and you didn't sign up for that, or maybe, maybe you just didn't want to run the Ironman, you didn't want to do the steeplechase, it just got too heavy. I do also know that, the, that Jesus promises, man, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that there's a promise that you don't have to do this life alone, that you're not walking alone in this, that Jesus said, man, I defeated sin in the grave, so you don't have to be, be, be chained by that. You don't have to walk in that, that there's victory in him. doesn't promise that this life will be easy, but that there's a victory, that there's a light at the end of the road, and that victory, that light is God himself. It is joining with all of eternity, and we will get on our hands and knees before the all-living God and saying, hallelujah, you are God. See, I think many of us are running a race but haven't realized that we run on an empty track. Some of us are running a race and we're so unaware of those that aren't running around us. There are open lanes, people in our lives, in our children, in our preschool, our kids' ministries, people in our high schools, teachers that are losing, losing loved ones who don't know Jesus. I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer for the day that I meet God for him to go, 
how come you didn't tell more people about me? How come you went on cruise control and autopilot through your Christianity? How come you were okay with running on an empty track? I don't have an answer for that. Here's my encouragement, man. May we never stop chasing after Jesus. And may we, Life Church, bring more people into this race. May we bring more people onto the track. May we bring more people to know who Jesus Christ is as their Lord and Savior of their life. May we run on a track that is so full that we need more chairs, more services, more campuses in our community because we are losing people to Satan and we are losing them for eternity. There should be a sense of urgency about us bringing people to know Jesus. There should be a sense of excitement and passion. The same one that shoots out of the blocks at a 100 meter race. The same one that's excited knowing that I only got nine seconds to get down that track if I want to win it. That should be the excitement and urgency that we run with. And my hope and encouragement is that we do that daily. The Bible says, man, this, this life is a vapor. That it's short. And if you've ever lost anybody in your life, you know that it's short. Even if you saw it coming, you still look back and go, man, that was short. You know life is short. So let's have some urgency, some excitement to go and share Jesus Christ with people. Whether that's the word or through action, whether that's inviting them to something. Let us pray. Lord, again, we just want to lift up those families and friends that are affected by the deaths of these two young men. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just bring a sense of peace that could only be answered by the living God. Lord, I pray that you would uh, surround them with amazing love, whether it's from church body, maybe they don't even belong in a church or aren't part of a church. Lord, I pray that they know that they have a church right across the street from their high school with people who just want to love on them. I want to pray for them. And Father, I just lift up uh, Life Church, the people of Life Church. Man, will he be excited that we get to be a part of the race because it is an honor and privilege to partner with you, to be used by you, to be your hands and feet for your kingdom. So Lord, I ask that we would see lives changed because of you. It may not be by ours or by a church name, but be by your power and your glory. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that we get an opportunity to do that. So Lord, any of those that are not in the race, I pray that you give them the courage to maybe come up here and pray with somebody from our prayer team to make that decision to jump in the race for the first time. So in Jesus' name, we love you. Amen.